You're listening to Jay's Analysis, integrating film, philosophy, geopolitics, literature, history, economics, intrigue, and espionage, only at jaysanalysis.com. And now, Jay's Analysis Podcast, with your host, Jay Dyer. For tuning in to Jay's analysis and my interview with F. William Engdahl. And I wanted to kind of preface the interview with a discussion of his earlier book, Full Spectrum Dominance Totalitarian Democracy in the New World Order. And I want to say that this book is also really, really good. In fact, it's pretty prophetic. If you go back and look, you know, the, the book was written around the time of the 2008 Georgia crisis where Russia and the West were uh, kind of squabbling over the situation of uh, Georgia and uh, Saakashvili, who was the Western agent installed as the uh, CIA puppet there. And of course, we know about the uh, revolutions and so forth that they've tried in all these different places, um, color revolutions. And what's interesting about uh, Ingdahl's book is that the war in Georgia kind of kicked off a lot of this uh, a lot of the geopolitical strategies that we're watching play out today. So I think if you look at the color revolutions in Soros, uh, it was it was Ingdahl really who was calling it 100% all the way back then and just nailed it across the board. Everything in this book nails what we're seeing today and it's still applicable. It's not dated because he talks about not just the color revolutions and that technology, but he also talks about the Rand Corporation's technique of swarming and the symmetrical warfare, excuse me, asymmetrical hybrid warfare that uh, Andrew Karibko and I talked about. You can find all that in full spectrum dominance. And for those of you that might be new to this or aren't under, maybe not aware of geopolitics and Cold War and all that, uh, full spectrum dominance is really this notion coming out of the Pentagon of controlling all areas of life and it includes everything from economics to big oil to the economy or to uh, markets like gold markets uh, to weaponry and so forth the internet and even into the areas of genetic modification GMOs right the whole spectrum of of the biosphere really is intended to be uh, under this aegis of uh, full spectrum dominance so I want to recommend that book first, and I think that perhaps in the future we will uh, we'll do an interview in that regard, uh, Professor Ingdahl and I, because we do get into that book a little bit, but we mainly focus on Lost Hegemon, as you'll see when we come to that uh, part of the interview. But uh, he talks about controlling China through the synthetic democracy that's there. This is a really good chapter. Uh, he talked about the expansion of AFRICOM back then this is prior to you know the whole coney situation the weaponizing of human rights uh, he even gets into the situation with the dalai lama i've talked about the dalai lama being a, a western stooge uh, i didn't know because i just just got this 2008 book that uh, he'd been talking about that for a long time so you're really going to get a good insight into geopolitics from this book uh, he talks about the expansion of u.s bases and how this is a a key aspect of uh, the Pentagon's control of the globe, basically. There's a chapter uh, on uh, the space, to pro space program, which I've talked about at length, and what the space program is intended to, to do. Rand Corporation, Dr. Strangelove, all of that plays into this heavily, and it's not dated. That's what's so uh, amazing to me is that you know, I picked up this 2008 book and I'm sitting here reading it and it's, it's reads like right now. So <laughs> I definitely say you should get this as well as Lost Hegemon. And uh, I'm sure Professor Ingdahl's other books are good. I haven't read the other ones, so I can't speak on them, uh, but definitely check that one out. And next we're going to talk about Lost Hegemon. And uh, this is of course the free half of the interview for those who are not subscribers to Jay's Analysis. If you want to get the full talks and interviews, definitely go to jaysanalysis.com and there's a PayPal links there for 
uh, four ninety five a month and for sixty dollars a year. You can also get my book, which is now shipping, Esoteric Hollywood Sex Cults and Symbols and Film, where I look at movies and kind of decode them, decode the symbolism, but I also tie in philosophy and geopolitics and esoteric elements and all of that. It's one giant tome, 363 pages, 404 footnotes, that I think is a great way to to wake up your friends and relatives to how the world really works through the medium of movies and fiction. If you'd like to see more of his articles and the rest of Professor Ingdahl's works, you can go to William Ingdahl, that's E-N-G-D-A-H-L dot com, and you'll find his newsletter, his audios, any videos and books and articles there as well. And I would also like to highlight that uh, I think it's great that Professor Ingdahl highlighted North Korea as a vassal state. Uh, if you recall, I wrote an article on that a couple of years ago that I think ties in perfectly with what uh, Professor Ingdahl, Ingdahl writes in his analysis here, where he points out the uh, longtime uh, clown figure dictator there. If you look into his uh, background, you'll find out that, of course, he attended a lot of the same boarding school, Swiss boarding schools uh, of CIA kids and so forth. Uh, it's a very, very fascinating background, definitely something to check out. And you can also look at my article, my article from April, April 13th, 2013, where I discuss North Korea as a totally staged fake state. <laughs> and you'll notice here all this propaganda, the, the uh, CGI altered images and then the ridiculous so-called space program that we are threatened every few every year actually uh, every <clears throat> march april with the nuke attack that's going to come from north korea here with the uh, 1984 war games set photo here and this is all nonsense uh, while the guy uses an iphone uh, you can check that out at jaysanalysis.com breaking busted totally staged and hilarious north korean photos now we're going to get to the interview with uh, professor ingdahl uh, in his new book the lost hegemon you're listening to jay's analysis today i have with me f william ingdahl he is the award-winning geopolitical analyst tr strategic risk consultant author professor and lecturer mr ingdahl has researched and written about geopolitics for over 30 years his various books on geopolitics include the interactions between international power, economics, and geography. His works have been translated into 14 languages, including Chinese, French, German, and Japanese. Most recently, he's written the book Lost Hegemon, Whom the Gods Would Destroy, and I was really happy to read this. I thought it, uh, it jived well with a lot of the articles and research that I've done the last couple of years, and so I'm honored to have him as a guest. How are you? How are you, Jay? I'm glad to be with you. I'm very good. I also noticed on your website you had a uh, Pentagon is, uh, excuse me, North Korea is a vassal state of the Pentagon. I wrote an article about that a couple years ago, and nobody else has said this. <laughs> okay. So I'm glad that somebody else finally said that. Well, I had this fascinating Davos discussion by chance with James Lilly. He's now deceased, but he was 30 years together with George Bush Sr. and the CIA, and then was named to be ambassador to Beijing during the Tiananmen Square business. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he was dropping the comment, I think he had a couple of glasses of wine, maybe too many, then uh, he dropped the comment to me, uh, after the end of the Cold War, if North Korea didn't exist uh, as this rogue state kind of idea, mm -hmm. then we'd have to create it as an excuse to keep our sixth fleet in, in the uh, Sea of Japan. Yeah, so, exactly. It's almost yeah. like uh, I, I kind of view Castro the same way as sort of a, a boogeyman who's positioned in a certain area for a certain region, allowed to be. Well, the interesting thing about Castro is if you can't understand what the Castro geopolitics are unless you understand the Vatican, because he, he is uh, supported 120% by the uh, Vatican. So the world is more complex than most people give it credit for. Well, I was Roman Catholic for 10 years before leaving it, so I do have an understanding of, of Vatican geopolitics, and so I do understand where you're going with that. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll, we'll touch on some of that, but let's talk about your new book, Lost Hegemon. Uh, what inspired this before we get into some of the actual text? The book, 
I've been looking at, at the Middle East for well over 30 years. I wrote it. My first book was in 1992, and it was called uh, Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics, and it was mm -hmm. about the battles of British intelligence and then later the U.S. intelligence to control the huge oil resources of the Middle East through coup d'etats, through manipulations, through putting the Shah of Iran in uh, power in Iran in 1953-54 after they got rid of Mossadegh mm -hmm. because he wanted to have a, a nationalized oil company instead of British Petroleum, right. which is uh, reasonable enough. So I had been interested in uh, the geopolitics of the Arab world for, for quite some time. And then when Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, launched something called the, well, it was called by the press, the Arab Spring. There was no spring at all, but uh, right. I, I began researching that and realized that the Obama administration was very clearly aiming to install Muslim Brotherhood regimes in all of the key countries of the Middle East, from Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, uh, if they had gotten away with it, they'd do the same in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunni-backed Muslim Brotherhood regimes, backed by Saudi and Qatari money, oil money and gas money. And I decided this really had to go much deeper. And as I researched the idea for a book, uh, I, it, it just unfolded in such a fascinating way that uh, the book almost wrote itself. Yeah, I, I've read several, several books in this genre, and yours is really good about tying in elements that the other books didn't, like if you read Dreyfus or Mark Curtis or any of those guys. I thought the history of Ottoman Empire was interesting that you, that you talk about, how that sets it up with yeah. the British yeah. uh, in, in where we are today, because the British needed the, the help of the Arabs against the Ottomans, correct? Right. Yeah, they wanted to dismantle the Ottoman Empire in order to... They already, in 1914, there was a, uh, a map in the London Petroleum Review, mm -hmm. 1914, this is before the beginning of the First World War, and the map was precise map of the huge oil finds in Mosul and other areas of, then it was called Mesopotamia, today it's called Iraq. Mm -hmm. And this this was a British petroleum magazine. Now the Baghdad railway line from Berlin to Baghdad in Mesopotamia, with the agreement of the uh, uh, the Ottoman Turkish uh, uh, Sultan, would go right through Mosul and those oil fields, and Deutsche Bank and the uh, Anatolia Railway Company that they founded would have right of way to all oil and mineral resources 20 kilometers right and left of the rail line. So you can connect the dotted lines. The British were absolutely ballistic at the prospect of a German built railway line going right to the, actually to the Persian Gulf where mm -hmm. it would challenge the, uh, uh, the agreements that the British Royal Navy had for oil supplies from, from the Shah of Iran back then, and from Kuwait. So the role of, of history in this is absolutely crucial. And what what's unfolding now is, is really an attempt by some very thin-minded, thin-brained people I call, uh, uh, call the neocons mm -hmm. in Washington and the various think tanks to simply arbitrarily redraw the Sykes-Picot uh, arrangement of, of 1916 in the Middle East when the British and the French carved it up. Carved it up, right. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, this, the, the book is really following that thread, but, but then the actual development of the Muslim Brotherhood itself, it has a continuity going from 1926 when Hassan al-Banna humble school teacher from the backwaters of Egypt, a mm -hmm. small town, created an organization that's probably as sophisticated as the Jesuit Society of Jesus in, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. or the SS of, of Heinrich Himmler. 
who modeled his SS, by the way, on the Jesuits. Mm. And uh, so, so this Hassan al-Banna is really a, a straw man, I think, for a much more sophisticated intelligence operation that became the Muslim Brotherhood. And then what the book traces out, what I trace out is when uh, the, the British cracked down on the Brotherhood, because the Brotherhood were supported at certain times by British uh, in Egypt, and at other times they were unwelcome. So uh, during the war they were unwelcome, and the uh, uh, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who was one of the leading brothers together with Hassan al banna the founder, mm -hmm. took exile in Berlin and met with Himmler, the SS head, and met with Hitler. Right. And, uh, you know, from there he began radio broadcasting on the most powerful shortwave radio in all of Europe into Palestine, into the uh, Arab Middle East, uh, preaching hatred of the Jews, extermination of the Jews, you know, kill the last Jew out of Palestine, mm -hmm. with a full concord of Hitler personally. So then, you know, how this morphed after, after World War II into a discovery a lot of these Muslim brotherhoods uh, who were uh, cultivated by the SS, and actually they made a division called the Hanchar SS that mm -hmm. fought against the, the communist partisans in Yugoslavia and Bosnia. Uh, they were discovered by the CIA station chief in the early 1950s in Munich, Germany, where they were kind of hiding out. And the CIA discovered these guys really are killer dogs against anyone who's a communist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they've been recruited from the Muslim populations of, of the Soviet Union, which has huge Muslim population. So that kind of begins this obscene marriage, as I call it, uh, between the CIA and the Muslim Brotherhood, a death cult mm -hmm. by the writings of Hassan al banna and <coughs> A death cult, death to the glory of Allah, killing right. infidels is the highest honor. Yeah, I like how you tied it into the model of the secret societies. That's something that, that I've written about as well in the past. And uh -huh. this kind of ties into my understanding is that sort of the older model that the British would use of, uh, of Freemasonry, the way that they would set up anywhere that the empire expanded, they would set up a lodge and that would kind of function as an intelligence network. Yeah. Uh, and you have the same kind of pattern, I think, with the CIA pretty much taking over the British usage of Salafist, Wahhabist Islam, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. and then, uh, the, so when the Brotherhood was forced into exile because they tried and failed to assassinate Nasser, the uh, president of Egypt in the yep. 50s, Miles Copeland, I interviewed him shortly before his death when he was living in, in England, oh, wow. Miles Copeland, the Cairo station chief of the CIA, mm -hmm. arranged to smuggle out the leadership of the Brotherhood into Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. the most reactionary, camel-herding, desert-loving Bedouin uh, medieval population on the face of the earth, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And the Muslim Brotherhood provided the teachers in the madrasas and in the universities and so forth. and. The Saudis made a deal, the royal house, the royal house, they liked their whiskey and their women and uh, slipping around, you know, not sure. exactly true to the Salafist uh, uh, Sharia law, but uh, the monarchy got the agreement that the Muslim Brotherhood would go outside Saudi Arabia, they'd leave the monarchy alone, and uh, in, in return, the Saudi oil money would finance the Muslim World League uh, in Jeddah, which would then set up operations of Muslim Brotherhood recruiting mm -hmm. and schools and so forth in Pakistan and Afghanistan and uh, any place they could get their foot in the door. And that became, back in the end of the 1970s, early 80s, under CIA uh, supervision, that became the Mujahideen mm -hmm. that was trained in, Afghan in uh, Pakistan by the Pakistani CIA, the so-called ISI, and sent into Afghanistan to sabotage any and everything that the Soviet Red Army was, was doing to try to stabilize the country. And, uh, yeah, then from there it goes into Russia itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then it goes into the Middle East with the Bush Jr. Uh, occupation of Iraq in 2003, and David Petraeus creating this gang, counter gang called uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. 
and now you have the ISIS, which is just, you know, it's, it's at a certain point, they're not very creative people, these, these <laughs> yeah. uh, CIA and income poops. They just, you know, only thing they can do is create chaos and destruction. Just I think the interesting the thing plans. is, yeah. it's not working the way it did even five years ago. Well, I like that you mentioned the, the Bible Belt. I grew up in the Bible Belt, so I'm, I'm very familiar okay. with that whole neoconservative, you know, uh, sort of usage of religion for geopolitical purposes. And I remember when I was 18 or 19, I would hear Bible lectures and you would hear, oh, Russia is Gog and Magog and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you grow, I think, hopefully an understanding as you get older. <laughs> Most people don't in the Bible Belt. But you realize that, oh, that's not actually about Russia. That's actually talking about something, you know, that happened a thousand years ago in the Middle East. Yeah. This is all geopolitical wrangling to try to get yeah, people yeah. you know behind these these neoconservative policies well i i grew up in the bible belt as well i grew up in texas and uh, in the 50s and the 60s and i was really more than fascinated i was shocked by the emergence in the, in the time of the vietnam war of these fundamentalist televangelists like mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Jerry Falwell and so forth. Almost every one of them turns out to be a crook and a manipulator, a swindler. Right. But the the political power, uh, Pat Robertson uh, was another one. Yeah. And uh, you know they were just demigods like Donald Trump, but uh, you know with this religious cloth around them, and people would just enslave themselves to to these demagogues. And that really, I, the more I looked into that, the more I realized this is a a very frightening development for the United States because it has nothing to do with traditional notions of Christianity, mm -hmm. brotherhood, uh, charity, and so forth. This is all about hate and kill. Yeah, that the the neoconservative, especially that moral majority period in the eighties, is when when they really sort of stepped up. That yeah, you know, and, and I think Liberty University is a obviously a kind of CIA recruitment area for the right wing CIA, and then you've got. You know, other people at Harvard and Columbia, you know, they go into the left wing CIA or whatever. Yeah. The more globalist uh, notion of it. But I thought that was really good, especially when you talked about the the um, Campus Crusade and Soldiers of Christ and how that was really ramped up by the military as a way to engineer soldiers into thinking that, you know, oh, we're actually fighting for Jesus here when we go and destroy all these brown people. And I got it. Ridiculous. But <laughs> 500 million, you say, put into campus crusade for christ yeah well the uh, the interesting thing is it goes back to billy graham mm -hmm. and uh, the rockefeller brothers back in the 1950s they financed the billy graham world crusade the world evangelist crusade mm -hmm. uh, as a you know anti-soviet anti-communist operation to get the american population uh, equipped up on this uh, on this whole track yeah, and uh, the other books we'll talk about that when they wanted to promote Wahhabism and Salafism across the Middle East, they were looking for Billy Graham type uh, Middle Eastern preachers, and that that was yeah. what yeah that the Muslim Brotherhood was intended to be that kind of a recruitment arm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now you talked about the uh, right before we got you get to the Sykes Pico agreement. You talk about Ottomans and that they sided with Germany and. I want to ask you, I had just finished doing a, a lecture series on Car Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope book, mm -hmm. and he says that, you know, it's always been the policy of the 20th century on the part of the Atlanticist establishment to make sure that there was a weak Germany and a weak Russia, and that they mm -hmm. never that they never worked together, and I'm guessing this goes back even to this, this period of the Ottomans, right? Oh, no, no question about it. The... I document this in great detail in my book, uh, Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics, mm -hmm. going back to the period before the First World War. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning this German creation with Deutsche Bank and uh, Siemens and mm -hmm. major steel companies and so forth of the Baghdad Berlin Railway. And that was a geopolitical transformation of the entire map of the British Empire because it carried the potential to link the oil-rich lands of the Ottoman Empire, including Iraq, what we talked about, mm -hmm. link it 
to Germany over land, and the British Navy could not challenge that were that to, to be accomplished. And the machinations that the British made, the British roundtable circles and so forth, to encircle Germany with a series of secret treaty agreements with the, the most tragic is with the Tsar of, of Russia, who was mm -hmm. actually not a bad person, Nicholas. Uh, and Russia at that point was doing some beautiful things with its economy. But uh, after the British uh, ramped up the Japanese to defeat the uh, the Russian fleet in the uh, Russia, Russo uh, Japanese War of, of 1905, uh, they weakened the uh, resolve of the Tsar and he made this secret agreement with Britain and at the same time France did a similar thing. So you had a triple entente France, mm -hmm. Germ uh, uh, Britain, excuse me, France, Britain, and Russia against Germany and Austro Hungary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. It didn't take much. It took only the, uh, uh, you know, arranged assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne to trigger the whole series of secret agreements that uh, started World War One. So, uh, the the interesting thing about Quigley, uh, it's one of the special books in my private library, *The Tragedy and Hope*. But the, uh, I was told by someone who did uh, 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 research at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, mm -hmm. on archives and so forth for a dissertation at, at Princeton where I studied. He told me that uh, Quigley was given access to the private uh, off-limits archives of the Council on Foreign Relations with one proviso. And I, I challenge you to check this in, in the index, that they not talk about the role of the Rockefellers mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. entire history. And when you read the book, you think, oh my gosh, this is really the inside scoop. And the only thing that's left out except for one reference to Nelson Rockefeller, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is meaningless, it's nothing at all significant, you would think that the House of Morgan uh, was running everything, and that's, that's just nonsense. So, well, he specifically well, he, says that in the uh, France chapter. He says that the Rothschilds uh, sort of lost power and that the dominant banking family in the world that took over was the Morgans. Yeah, yeah, but it, uh, that lasted until 1931. The Morgans were dominant mm -hmm. at, at the end of, uh, at the Versailles talks that created the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. They dominated the CFR at the beginning, but then they set up this whole gold arrangement and, and uh, J.P. Morgan syndicated loans to uh, stabilize the economies of, of Europe after you know, after 1919, mm -hmm. including Germany, and when that came crashing down and uh, England left the gold standard in 1931, the House of Morgan ceased to be the uh, unique banker for the British uh, government, and uh, Morgan became a, a relatively uh, minor player, and quietly the Rockefellers went into ascendancy in the administration of all things of, of FDR. Mm. Yeah. And that I go into in, in my other book called The Gods of Money, uh, Wall Street and the Death of the American Century. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a fascinating history. I, I know very few sources that have really uh, looked at that in, in that way. It's, well, it's very hey, good. I've got a couple of your books. I'll have to get that one uh, because you're, you're absolutely right. And I read the entire book. I just finished it not too long ago. Um, and the Rockefellers do not play prominently at all in Tretch yeah. Hope, and that's a great point. It's a little bit of a gap. <laughs> is, yeah. Especially and, since the Rockefeller Foundation in 1939 mm -hmm. financed the CFR War and Peace Studies. Right, right. And that set out the the roadmap of, of U.S. world domination, including the creation of the United Nations, the Security Council, the whole uh, shebang. Right. So to ignore that is really... a, a a grievous uh, defect. Yet it's a brilliant book. Uh, I, I had a, I knew someone who studied under under Quigley at Georgetown, and he said this was shortly before Quigley died. He said, "Was it Bill? <laughs> what was it, Bill Clinton?" I'm joking. No, no, it wasn't Bill Clinton. Uh, he said that Quigley confided into me in, uh, to me privately. 
I was one of his favorite students, uh, that he was completely terrified that he had, despite he didn't mention the Rockefellers, that he had said too much mm -hmm. and tried to hope and that they were they were going to kill him. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very complex thing behind uh, the Quigley books. Also, the other book, uh, The Anglo-American Establishment, that he wrote, mm -hmm is a much less polished piece of work, but it's very useful because it goes into the round table side of the right. Anglo-American establishment. Yeah, he's a very interesting character and it was not an easy read. <laughs> 1,300 pages of very dry. No. He's a military historian, so it's pretty <laughs> dry. But um, yeah. Now let's talk about the, the role of Israel. I, I like the way that you explained it, and this is how I had been understanding it, it, it as, you know, a lot of people are, make a, a deal about Zionism, which it is a big deal, or they do have a lot of power. But in the Heartland <clears throat> theory of Mackinder, uh, Israel functions, as I've seen it, as a kind of geostrategic outpost for the yep. Atlanticists, and that's why they set it up. Is that Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think if you look at Israel from the standpoint of religion, you're lost. Right. Uh, if you look at anything from the standpoint of religion and, and belief, you're lost. I think the, the best comment uh, I've come across on, on religion is, is the one I quote in, in The Lost Hegemon from Seneca, uh, 60 years before Christ. He said, religion is regarded by the common people as true by the wise as false, and by rulers as useful. And I think that... <laughs> yeah, Plato's that's, noble lie, yeah. Yeah, I think that sums it up quite quite nicely. But uh, uh, Israel, it, it, it's it's the right-wing Likud of Netanyahu. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be precise in a, in a clinical historical way, it's a fascist police state regime that uh, Israel has become under Netanyahu and it follows an agenda of geopolitics now mm -hmm. if that agenda is shifting right now away from the united states toward something else is not uh, to me not, not not quite yet clear i know that they have made uh, overtures to putin's russia they've made overtures to china and so forth and uh, what that's a part of in terms of a uh, recalibration of, of geopolitical power I think it's a little bit premature to say now this <clears throat> this next chapter you get into the Muslim Brotherhood and the holy war against the Jews and the uh, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem now I had read that that, that was basically just a, an office created by the British the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem yeah that's true that's true okay. originally it was but then uh, these things go go through transformations, you know, as, as the power calculus shifts uh, mm -hmm. in the onset of World War Two and and, uh, and so forth. That the you know, and then the Grand Mufti maybe he gets used to having this this power, even mm -hmm. if the British keep to him. He says, uh, "Okay, well, I'm going to use this," <laughs> and he did some pretty nasty stuff. He cut a deal. It's it's a little bit like. Uh, uh, Erdogan, maybe, in, in Turkey. That's what I was going to ask you about next, was the, okay. the Gulen, uh, Fethullah Gulen. You, you mentioned that prominently in your book in a few places, and we've seen that in no. the news lately. I wrote an article for, for Cadillon about it, and I made the argument that it looked like it was kind of tying back into that uh, grand chessboard strategy of, of trying to sw swing Turkey back away from NATO and in the sphere of, of Russia. Would you, is that true? Uh, you're saying Erdogan, or, yeah, or yeah, the, the attempt of, uh, of Russia to try to persuade Erdogan away from NATO uh, and to sort of rid him of the CIA networks of Gulen. Yeah, but what uh, Gulen is a, a project of the CIA. It's one right. of the most, until the failed coup d'état of July 15th in, in Turkey, it uh, was one of the least. Uh, understood in, in uh, of all these CIA operations with with uh, Islamic terrorism, mm -hmm. and uh, remarkably similar as a, a Turkic version uh, versus the Sunni Arab version called the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. uh, 
in, in its ideology and structure and so forth. It's a secret society. It's somewhat uh, been compared by former members to the Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a cult with very strict rules, top-down mm -hmm. organization. But uh, the Erdogan, I think, is, is an opportunist. I don't think he has a clear vision the way Xi Jinping, just to take an example from China, mm -hmm. has a very clear vision of the Silk Road uh, new economic uh, rail and port infrastructure, the OBOR, One Bridge, One Road. He has a very clear idea of what he wants to do with that and how, and therefore he's proceeding step by step. But uh, Erdogan is an opportunist who is thrown from pillar to post in his thinking. He cut a deal with Fethullah Gulen to get his AKP party in power uh, some years ago. And that worked okay at the beginning. Uh, and the deal included that uh, Fethullah Gulen's sect would have control over the education ministry of Turkey and would be allowed to uh, penetrate the Turkish uh, court system, the judiciary, and then they also began to go into the military. And at a certain point, there was a falling out in 2013 between Erdogan and Gulen. Mm -hmm. Gulen, by the way, is in Sailorsburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, in CIA-sponsored exile since 1998, when he made speeches uh, that were taped by Turkish military intelligence that were a little bit treasonous. <laughs> and uh, he even when Erdogan was on good terms with him and invited Gulen to come back to Turkey, he was afraid to come back, I think, because uh, he feared that he would be uh, exposed for what, what he really is. Uh, I don't think Gulen himself uh, does any of this uh, strategic thinking. He's uh, dropped out of school in the fifth grade in a Turkish village. But, uh, you know, he's the front man with a smiling face and this kind of grandfatherly white hair appearance. You've been listening to the first free half of my interview with F. William Ingdahl. If you'd like to get his books or read his articles and check out his videos and audios, you can go to williamingdahl.com. To hear the rest of this interview, you can subscribe at Jay's Analysis for $4.95 a month or for $60 a year at the PayPal links at my site. You can also get Esoteric Hollywood Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film, my book, which is now shipping and available. It's 404 footnotes, 363 pages, and 50-plus sidebars. I think you'll enjoy it if you like my film analyses. So thank you for listening and tell your friends.